So hi, everyone. My name is Julia Rocky. I am your host for today. I am the author of Amen, Questions for a God I Hope Exists, out from Lake Drive Books. And uh, the occasion for today, as I was just mentioning a moment ago, is my 40th birthday. I turned 40 on July 22nd, and it has been a month of pondering and questioning and taking in the, the magnitude and the excitement of this milestone. And I thought, what, what would be a really fun way to celebrate? Well, I would love to learn from people who have gone before me already in this milestone. So I reached out to Shannon Evans uh, to, as I was saying online, to be my emotional Sherpa for the event. She is uh, three months ahead of me on, <laughs> on this journey, but she is- Old and wise. <laughs> Um, she's a fellow author, Catholic, parent, woman, thinker, feeler, and I just uh, really respect and admire her, and I'm delighted that she um, uh, took this time to be with us today. Quick uh, housekeeping notes before I read Shannon's official bio and we get into the questions. As I was saying earlier, you are welcome to keep your videos on during this. You're also welcome to turn them off. There's no need to be on screen if you need an eye break. Uh, we will have opportunities to participate in chat over the, the course of the hour. Um, so keep your eyes and ears open for that. And um, basically, we are just really delighted that you are here. And special shout out to my publisher, David Morris, the uh, brains and heart behind Lake Drive Books. Thank you, Lake Drive, for hosting this event today. And we'll hear more from them, uh, more from David in, in, over the course of the hour as well. So. Let me uh, give Shannon her due for a moment, moment. So Shannon Evans is the spirituality and culture editor at the National Catholic Reporter. And she's most recently the author of Feminist Prayers for My Daughter, Powerful Petitions for Every Stage of Her Life. And you can also check out um, other books and devotionals she's written, including Rewilding Motherhood, Your Path to an Empowered Feminine Spirituality. She's particularly interested in ecofeminism, social change, contemplative practice, and this is kind of near and dear to my heart, leads workshops and retreats across the country that spark curiosity and compassion. She's partnered with the Jesuits of Canada there in the US, the fellow Catholic in the house, and is a frequent contributor to Franciscan media. And she loves to travel, but is happiest at home on the Iowa Prairie with her family and beloved chickens. And if any of you follow Shannon on her social media channels, there is a fabulous amount of chicken content for, for, those, who, <laughs> for those who are enjoying it. So, um, so let's dive in with a level set. So Shannon, uh, when you and I touched base last Thursday and I was kind of sharing with you um, kind of what I was thinking about asking about, we really had to bite our tongues because we were so eager to jump into it. So uh, the, the first question I'm going to ask is a little bit more of an abstract one, but I want to start with what, what does faith look like for you right now at 40? Just, just a small, just a small just starting a small off, one, you know, yeah, just a warm up, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think I'm really, really happy it spiritually right now. It's the, it's the most, um, full I've felt spiritually in my life, which I think 22 year old me would be shocked by, because I remember being like, I remember being 22 and this is, this is kind of embarrassing, but I remember thinking like, well, I guess this is it. Like, I guess I got it all. Like what else am, is the rest of my life going to be like boring spiritually because I kind of feel like I got it all. And thankfully what that does, wasn't the case. What does got it all? What does that I don't mean know. to you at 22? <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know. I just, I just remember this feeling of like, well, you know, like I've kind of, I had like a very um, personal relationship with God. I kind of had this rhythm where like every day I would, you know, kind of have my my prayer and my Bible reading and stuff. But but more than that, like I felt like I had like all of the theological answers. There was definitely not like mystery or like kind of a curiosity for, you know, I was very happy with like the boundary lines and everything. So I just, I think there was part of me that like felt safe there, but also part of me that felt kind of like, ah, uh, like, ah, uh, this is, this might be a long road if, if I just kind of stay here my whole life. So happily that, that didn't turn out to be the case. And like, I think, you know, a lot of us probably here have gone through a lot of, um, like 
questioning and unpacking a lot of the the doctrine or the belief system that we were um, either overtly or you know implicitly handed down and and so that's not always easy and that's that's not fun and in my 30s there was a lot of that of kind of like um picking apart those things and kind of seeing what was left of what I actually did believe about God or or what I wanted my experience of God to be and I think that that's been the most exciting difference kind of turning the corner on 40 is that like the belief system is no longer as important as the experience and and the way that it impacts my interior life and the way that it impacts the way that I engage with the world. Um, so I think that's what's made me feel happiest and most peaceful right now is that um, it's it's like mystery can be beautiful and, and comforting and not scary. I love that. I love what you said about the belief system is not as important as the experience. And I know, yes, I definitely know from quite a few people on this call have been exploring similar terrain. And what um, were there particular external factors that were really leading to your questioning? Was it more of an interior journey? Can you take us a little bit mm. into you were mentioning that your 30s were a particularly fertile period for that questioning? What, yeah. what was transpiring that was leading to that? Yeah, well, in my 20s, I was like evangelical charismatic. And then like halfway through my 20s, that started breaking down. I kind of I became Catholic at 30. And oh, so there was I already. That. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, um, and my husband and I were missionaries in Indonesia when there, and that was kind of when everything started like unraveling of like having to question a lot of these things that I had been taught and that I just naturally assumed were true because that's what I had been taught. Um, and my parents are not, they're, they're pretty like mainline. Um, but in college, I kind of got into like the more evangelical movement. And um, so, yeah, I kind of like deconstructed into Catholicism and thought I was done then, you know, and then it was like, then my, my husband is definitely like a like has like a, a mystic heart and he's just sort of always like asking questions and seeking new experiences and so I I really like my comfort zone but he has not let me stay there <laughs> not <laughs> not out of course but just because he's curious about all of these different paths and so it's sort of forced me to also like learn about things that I wouldn't naturally you have explored like whether that's other spiritualities or um religions or like questioning even like you know the like catholic doctrine or teaching or kind of like mm -hmm. exploring like what is the history behind this like what what did people believe before this and what you know what came later and what was the what was the tension there and i don't know just like um so he's he's a culprit for sure but then there's like there's also just been you know being a woman in the church and i think you know, a Catholic woman for sure. But then I think a lot of most denominations probably share that struggle of um, at some point women have to kind of, well, I guess you don't have to, but if you're paying attention, you have to start reckoning with the patriarchy and mm -hmm. the misogyny of the history of Christianity and the way that it is still structured and the implications of all of that. And I think for a lot of us, that really propels that journey of kind of having to ask new questions about um, how we want to live our faith and what we actually believe about God and, and how much humanity has sort of um, has sort of created a narrative that that maybe wasn't like the divine intention. So mm, I love this. But, but so this is very exciting for me to learn that you converted to Catholicism because so I'm I'm a lifelong Catholic and though I certainly, you know, as as my book title suggests, entertain doubts and questions and try to live an examined faith. I, I never have dramatically strayed from the Catholic faith or considered going uh, to a different denomination. So I'm just really curious, this is so far from my perspective, like what attracted you to want to become Catholic because that's I meet a lot more people who are leaving Catholicism yeah. than I do people who are coming to it at the moment so would love to sure. would love to hear that that um for lack of a better term outside perspective yeah well there's there's a few things 
interestingly, a lot of them sort of oppose each other. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it all made sense to me at the time, I guess. Um, so it started out when we were, we were missionaries and we had really been trained on like the bridge method, right? Like getting people saved, um, getting people like to cross this line. And, and it was never comfortable to me. And I never felt um, fully aligned in it. Um, and so it, being like missionaries that were expected to do that was was really difficult for both me and my husband. And that was really for me, kind of the, the starting point of things unraveling of like, do I actually believe that it's, that it's that simple and that that's like mm-hmm. what I'm put on earth to do is to get people from one side of a line to another, you know? Um, and then my husband had been interested in Catholicism for a long time. And so when we moved back home, we started going to like liturgical style churches, Anglican churches and things like that. And, um, and I found a lot of like comfort at that point in the liturgy where I, I never thought that I would like that. But I find I found like when I didn't know really what I wanted or what I what I believed, like the liturgy was really um, grounding for me. So and then at the same time, ironically, I think the Catholic Church's certainty about everything was really attractive. Hmm. Um we also like right after we moved home adopted our first son and that was there was a lot of trauma it was really difficult Mm -hmm. and so I think having the theology of suffering really spelled out was really I I had come again from a very like healing focused background of like you pray for healing and Catholicism's like emphasis on finding meaning and redemption and suffering was really moving um but then yeah like I like in the midst of all of that also the certainty was very comforting to me of like there's something written about everything like what do you want to know the Catholic <laughs> Church has something written on it you know right um, and and then at the same time we got involved in the Catholic worker movement which is um like radical hospitality solidarity the works of mercy um but in a completely different way than we had experienced as missionaries which is very um relational and solidarity based and reciprocity and that was and yeah so a lot of things kind of coalesced at the same time to make the catholicism really attractive so it's not a simple answer but <laughs> i i knew you would have a, a rich path and i i didn't i did not appreciate yet until you answered this question just how dynamic the past 20 years in particular I mean, really the, yeah. the 40 but the past 20 in particular so you know not that we have a crystal ball so maybe I'll frame this more as what do you think your faith might look like at 60 or rather what do, what do you want it to look like at 60 mm. if I were to ask you the same question in 20 years what, what might you want to be answering me I love that um I want to continue feeling free, um, internal freedom to be honest with myself and be honest with God, um, and be honest with God's people. And I think that, Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the third one is the hardest for me because I'm like, I don't really like conflict. Um, and so I, historically, I have really had strong, strong opinions or beliefs or practices and kind of kept them to myself. And so growth for me has been like saying, no, actually I disagree with this or, or this is how I see it, which is maybe different than what you're presenting or things like that. So I want to grow more in that kind of freedom to be able to, um, yeah, to be able to be honest in my faith. And I also, I, I really am curious about, I think that there's a lot more for me to explore about eco-spirituality, which I I put in my bio because it is something that I have found. I found God in really um, ways that surprise adult me, but that feel very, um, very resonant with my childhood experience of God, of, of, Mm -hmm. of kind of being um, out in the wild and just the experience of my own heart in nature and so I think that there's probably a lot that 60 year old me knows about that, that 40 year old me currently does not. So I'm excited about that. Love it. Good. 
good, we'll, we'll do this again in 20 years on an entirely yeah. different web conferencing platform, I'm sure, when we get there. <laughs> Something to look forward to. But I want to bring it back to a more recent experience. Um, just so folks know, I did ask Shannon about this in advance, so um, she's willing to talk about it. So you had quite a big health scare this spring. So this was shortly before you turned 40. I, kn I know that I personally, you know, everybody, the title of this event, Midlife Crisis of Faith, that, fa that phrase midlife is like a little bit sobering. You think, is it my actual midpoint? Is it perhaps less? Might I be had the fortune of having even more time and it's not quite the midpoint that unknowing is tough right um and i know for me as a as a writer and as a spiritual person mortality sometimes has an outsized uh it takes up a lot of rent in my uh takes up a lot of real estate in my mind so it was curious because you you did actually have a very serious health scare. i'm going to give you talk a little bit about that experience and what mindset or or heart set did it put you in as you approached your milestone birthday? Yeah. Um, so I had for everybody, I had some kind of mysterious infection. Um, I, and that, that became sepsis and, and my body went into septic shock and I, because I delayed like going to the hospital because I thought I was fine. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's still, there's still like, no real answers of like, this is what caused it. I had my appendix out, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't super terrible, like to cause septic shock. So I don't know, it's very, it's very mysterious. And I kind of also think that probably a year of like counseling le le leading up to that, like probably affected my body in some ways. Um, but yeah, so I was, I was in the ICU for several days. Um, and kind of did not realize at the time how, how serious and how close it was, um, which was a good thing. But um, yeah, I, one thing that, ha that I obviously like, I think I'm going to be processing that for, for many years, but I think that the most obvious thing immediately after has been like, I'm going to have fun. <laughs> Like I'm going <laughs> to enjoy my life, you know? Um, and cause I, and I think that like, especially when you're in a season where you're raising children, like fun is not, it's like you're in survival mode. You're just trying to get things done. And, or maybe like when you're like in, in midlife or like right before it, like you're kind of in the meat of your career or like, it's just getting started and you are really putting a lot of energy towards that. And it's really, I, I don't know, I kind of realized like, I felt like not, I feel like I had kind of lost this whole part of myself um, in the past, like mm. 20 years, you know, um, that I really, I missed and I kind of realized I missed it. And so I've, I've made this sort of like the year of the fun. And so we've been like going to concerts and traveling and like, you know, n not traveling like to Europe or anything, but just like trying to, um, trying to, to make space in my life for things that are like just pleasurable and even just like having music on more often or, um, you know, I'm not like going crazy shopping, but like buying clothes that aren't like sensible, but that just like make me happy, you know, just kind of like little things here and there. And certainly like there are, there are extents to where that's like no longer like, appropriate or healthy, but, um, but I think it's a really good balance to, to what I had kind of been stuck in before, which was like, sort of this like martyrdom of like, oh, I'm just living to serve, like whether that's my family or like my readers or whoever, like I'm just mm. going to give of myself all the time. And no, now I'm kind of after that experience, it was like, I don't know how much time I have. Like, I want to, I want to be happy. I want to have fun. And I, and I want to like bring people I love along with it. So like, I took my two oldest kids to a concert this spring and like my husband and I are going to a concert, like a music festival this weekend for our anniversary, instead of just like doing dinner and a movie, <laughs> you know, just like yeah. things like that. And, you know, it's, I so appreciate you saying that because I think another aspect we lose sight of, you know, intimations of mortality or not I think those of us who contemplate spirituality forget that 
joy and fun and play are equally sacred. And you, you were talking earlier about kind of a theology of suffering and finding meaning and grief and suffering and stuff. And, and so often that draws our focus and attention and we forget the duality of, of, um, of of god whatever you know higher power we can see about the, the, of there to be and uh so i love that you're reclaiming this and and um reintroducing it it sounds like to your to your life and i i, I can't help but think that that's going to bring even more dimension to your faith life and your spirituality as well yeah yeah i i love that that you pointed that out because i think it's really true that we kind of see you know see growth or are we put more weight on you know things that feel heavier whether that's like suffering or you know making a difference in the world the the works of mercy things like that like and none of that is is anything to sneeze at you know but it's like but like you said like also joy and delight and pleasure like those things are of the of God, of the divine, or like you said, however you want to imagine it. For me, it's God. Um, those things are all a part of it. And I think, you know, the other day, my friend, my friend was like, every time I see your Instagram stories, you just seem like you're like bursting with life. And I was like, well, I don't know that I feel like that, uh, you know, every minute of the day. I wish there I were did. a lot of good filters, a lot of good filters on Instagram, <laughs> the bursting with life filter. It's sweat. It's just sweat. No, um, <laughs> But, but, but I'm like, but I, there is something to that since the spring, since that happened medically that like, I, I do feel kind of like this, um, I feel more alive and I feel really grateful. And I absolutely feel that that is a spiritual experience, that kind of aliveness. Yeah. Awesome. You know, Shannon has mentioned parenting a couple of times, so I'm going to touch on a parenting question, but everybody after we're going to have an opportunity for you to weigh in with questions in the chat right after that. So get your typing fingers ready if you um, if you had anything on your mind, but we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes. So Shannon, you've mentioned a couple of times your, your family. Um, I too am in the parenting stage of life of two children under five. And um, so one of the surprises of parenting for me is that I'm, I really don't feel like the parent I thought I was going to be in good and bad ways. Like I'm much more of a pushover than I thought I was going to be, which maybe isn't always the best, but I find that I also find that I'm really eager and willing to play, which is really fun and rejuvenating for me and has been a, you know, a great way to connect with my children and get to know them. So things like that. Um, and one of the interesting things, though, and granted, pandemic was in the middle of this, so we weren't going to church in person regularly. We weren't even really watching it um, online much because it was just too. It was. Like, it was not. It was, kids. I know, right? It was like basically they were treating it like Saturday morning cartoons, and like we're just going to do other things during this, and we're all just still in our pajamas and didn't have quite the gravity yeah, or or sanctity we were hoping. But we have since started going back to church in person. Um, so I was really glad to make that faith practice visible again. I'm finding I'm struggling with making our other faith practices and values visible. Like I wrote a book about spirituality. That means nothing to, <laughs> to my children. You know, like that's, I can't connect with them around that level of it yet. And we try to connect it to nature and talk about God's creation. And, you know, we say prayers at bedtime, but I feel like I haven't lit particularly my my older child like haven't lit a spark yet about the sense of something bigger and I would just I'm so curious how you've done it with uh with your children granted this may be different from child to child as well how have you embodied your faith for them and how how have you encouraged them to think about something beyond themselves mm -hmm. Yeah. whether that is a faith or just a greater sense of you're not the center of the universe. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I will start this off by saying I absolutely do not feel like an expert. And is this something that Eric and I kind of frequently come back to because we often don't feel like we're doing anything and we're like, okay, we've got to do like 
got to, you know, initiate some sort of practice for the kids or whatever. Um, I'm also like very, uh, kind of, um, protective of like what they learn from other people about God. So we do like religious education at home. They don't do it at, um, a parish because I'm like, I don't want people saying like X, Y, and Z to my kids or whatever. You're like, you know, it's kind of a control freak thing and I can't do it forever, but they're still like young enough that I can get away with it. Um, but so all of that to say, I frequently think of my friend, um, who kind of exists with, with one foot in like the academic world. She has a, she has a master's in theology. And, and so she often like hears things that I don't. And she told me a year ago, I guess that there's, um, this study done that showed like the, the greatest single indicator of a child continuing to practice their faith in adulthood is their parents just talking about it in regular life. Like Mm -hmm. it wasn't like youth group. It wasn't like religious education classes. Like it wasn't, it wasn't even like weekly church attendance. It was just their parents talking about it and, and kind of, and that makes sense to me, you know, of like, because kids, and I mean, especially this generation, like there's, as we all know, like everything's changing. And um, I think if, if it doesn't seem like it applies to life, and it doesn't bleed over to um, how they how they find themselves in the world and how they engage the world around them. Then, like they're not going to care, you know. Um, there's just too much too much else out there for them to explore, and it's gotta it's gotta be authentic and it's gotta make mm-hmm. it's gotta be more than just lip service. Um, so that was really. I, I come back to that a lot. And so I, I really rely on, although we do like experiment with different practices throughout the year, like I think the biggest thing I keep coming back to that is the biggest thing is just talking to my children about like why we care about this issue in our community, why we care mm-hmm. about um, working as uh, speaking out against racism or like why, why it matters that that you treat each other this way. And it all comes back to, you know, or or caring for creation or, you know, all of these things, like it kind of all comes back to our faith and what we believe about human beings made in the divine image and, and what we, what we believe about the earth and, and um, the, the creatures that we share the world with and things like that. Like, and it all kind of that's, so that's my greatest hope as a parent that I can make draw those parallels to where faith is a very very practical thing and not like a um, an intangible idea. So yeah, that's my two cents. Have you heard? Because your kids, you have older kids than than I do right now. How have you heard it reflected back to you, if at all? Yeah, mm-hmm. like what what are the kids saying to you, or when when have they? brought forth an idea themselves first yeah yeah oh I there was oh okay this is actually the other day so I have a nine and a half year old and the other day he was asking me about our time in Indonesia and I was like I was I was I was explaining to him that we kind of went thinking that we were gonna you know I didn't I didn't say like keep people out of hell but I was like (laughs) I was like I, you know, we thought that we, that people really needed us to come and teach them about God or to help them, you know, change their life, have a better life or whatever. And, and I was like, and what we kind of realized was that, you know, like, like we're all just, we're all just people and we just need each other and, and we all like need to be helping each other, but maybe like you know, then I went into like the white savior complex and like why we weren't the best people to like solve everybody's problems or whatever. But he said, he was like, he was like, yeah, mom, like you, you can't like make people's decisions for them. Like you have to let them Mm -hmm. live their life. That's what God would want. (laughs) I was like, yep. You know more now than I did at 22 (laughs) years old. (laughs) But yeah. So, I mean, things like that of just like, 
it, it feels good. And it, that doesn't happen every day. And even that it's like, that's an ongoing conversation that we will have that, mm-hmm. that has a lot of nuance to it that we need to continue to have with him. Um, but it just, it made me feel good to like, yeah, anytime that, anytime that they reflect back inclusion and love and justice, um, as, as their understanding of what God would want, um, for the world. And, you know, that was also like in 2020, excuse me, in 2020 with George Floyd, everything they heard Mm -hmm. about that. And we had that conversation and, and again, so like being able to tie what's happening socially, culturally, um, to, and the way that we respond to it back to our faith. I think that makes me really proud of them and makes me want to do a better job, you know, as on a, on a day-to-day basis with them. I love that. You know, that, that, that is all great framing. And I look forward to having more of those conversations with them as they, as they get fun. older too. It is really yeah. fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, right now, the, our biggest theological question was at Christmas time. Uh, my parents are on the call. We were uh, attending Christmas service with them at their parish uh, in Philadelphia, which was a, a much more ornate uh uh, parish than ours. And uh, the biggest theological question that day was why there wasn't a Tyrannosaurus Rex in the manger with baby Jesus. So we're like, oh, we have we have a lot of ground to, to make up here. <laughs> so, okay, playing catch up now. Um, but I promised everybody a, an opportunity to ask uh, your questions. Thank you to everyone who's been chiming in so far along the chat. Uh, so what I am curious to know from folks, if if you're willing to share, um, you can feel free to just put this in the chat, is what big question are you asking in your faith life right now? So I'll say that again. What big question are you asking in your faith life right now? Feel free to put that in chat. And while you're all typing that down, we're going to do, um, as uh, David said to me in an email earlier, station identification. We're going to do a quick round robin of all the different places that you can find Shannon, Lake Drive Books and me. So Shannon, as our guest of honor, would you like to start off with where folks can uh, continue to get to know you? Sure. Um, let's see. I I write a weekly Substack email. Um, I, I'm assuming most people here are familiar with Substack, but it's I the title is The Rewilded Life. But if you just put my name in, you could find it. Um, so I try to write like an original essay there and and just give updates on what's going on with me that week or like, you know, if I wrote anything or did a podcast and that'll be included there. Um, I'm most active on Instagram. I was an early, an early Instagrammer and I just haven't looked back. I love it. It's like, it's such a fun place to connect with people. And so I'm Shannon K. Evans there. Um, I have... A website shannonkevans.com and obviously you can find the work that I commission and edit for National Catholic Reporter there in the spirituality and culture section. Lovely. Thanks. Oh, David. and my books are with Brazos Press. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. David, you want to share some Lake Drive books info? Your thing, Julia, thank you. I'm David Morris, publisher of Lake Drive Books, um, where we create books that help you heal, grow, and discover. It is a brand new imprint, building it from the ground up. And I'm just so excited to have so many cool authors like Julia and then the partner with authors like Shannon in events like this. Uh, you can find more at lakedrivebooks.com, uh, where you can get to all of our social media links and and so on, and our newsletter. And I, I really do support, I really do implore you to support authors through uh, email follows and uh, social follows and engage online. That's how people are discovering books these days more than anything else, believe it or not. And uh, it's really important. I also want to mention, we also have a quick shout out to Marla Taviano and Scott Okamoto. Thanks both for being here. They're fellow Lake Drive Books authors. You'll also find their books, very cool books on the Lake Drive Books website. And speaking of many of the themes that Shannon has talked about today, particularly in, in what her faith journey was looking like in her 20s and 30s, and the idea of deconstructing and and questioning where you have you have landed in um, in the nature of of your personal belief. Um, and then so yep, that leaves me. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm the author of Amen: Questions for God I Hope Exists. You can find that on the Lake Drive Books uh, website. We have lots of 
different re retailer ordering options. Uh, you can also find me at my website, juliarocky.com, where you have an opportunity to sign up for my monthly newsletter. Uh, and I write a monthly reflection there as well. Uh, I'm across social at a, different handles, but if you any permutation of my name, Julia Rocky, you'll be able to find me. Uh, but it's also one stop shopping over at my website. So again, that's juliarocky.com. And I'm really glad you all could be here today. So thanks to those of you who put um, some, there's some really good questions here. So I'm just going to use a couple of these as a jumping off point. Um, so I'm intrigued by Melanie's question about what do adult friendships, especially post COVID adult friendships look like in midlife? Uh, what should they look like? Or is there even a should? Uh, Shannon, do you want to? I, yeah, I'd love to hear because I, I get a sense from your, I mean, I know social media isn't always reality, but I get a sense that you have a really vibrant community around you online and off. And yeah, what, what has friendship, friendship looked like to you in this stage of life? Mm. It probably looks better, like, <laughs> from, from your point of view than it actually is. I mean, I find it hard too. Honestly, my I have like one best friend here locally. And then obviously I have a lot of friends, but I don't necessarily like hang out with them all the time or whatever. And then a lot, like my other best friends are all like people that I've met from the internet and we like meet up once a year or something. And, but like we Vox every day, you know? Um, so if you guys don't know what Voxer is, if you have any like in internet friends, you need to Vox with them so you can send them you can send them messages back and forth every day. And that's like, seriously, I love, I love doing that with my besties. Um, so yeah, I think that that is actually something that's kind of unique to our generation. There's like this shift of like, because of social networks, a lot of us are finding like more like-minded people far away. Um, and so kind of whether that's like an online community or you do what I do and you like, you know, vox each other every day or whatever. I think that's kind of like a, um, it's a blessing and a curse. Like it's, it's hard because, you know, mm -hmm. the distance, but it's also a gift because if you're, you know, feeling lonely or isolated, um, wherever you are, like there is, there's a whole world out there <laughs> to connect with, which is, which is nice. Um, I am like an introvert with social anxiety. And so like, I am nine times out of 10, just at my house but like I really like my friend and I are gonna I have a my my one local bestie that I mentioned like we we try to have fun together like she's a mom too like she's she teaches um at a community college like we're both like working parents so we're like when we get together like we want it to be fun so we went to the Taylor Swift concert like we're going to the Barbie movie this weekend you know like <laughs> we're like we're doing like you are you're my fun, fun. Yeah. yes like, <laughs> Like, it's also, you know, really important to like have people to vent to, but like my, yes, my year of fun, like this is my soapbox I'm going to die on apparently this year, hopefully not actually die, knock on wood. Um, but, but I think that it, you know, so often when we think of friendships in adulthood, we're like longing for that, like, just like the deep heart connection. And that is really important. And like, there's nothing wrong with wanting that. And I hope that we all have that. But I think also like sometimes we do just need need to like somebody to remind us that we need to have fun. My a friend of mine who lives out of state said that she and some local friends have like a decadent day, like once a quarter, and they like go to like a spa or they go to like some amazing restaurant or just something that like they wouldn't normally do. And I'm like, I think I want I need to steal that idea. I really love that of like just having having people to celebrate life with for no reason you know yeah that's an interesting point I think Melanie the way I would answer your question I'm, I'm kind of cluing into the the second part that you you had on there about the the should is there even a should and I, I think to Shannon's point about there being only so much time in a day uh, particularly in a season where I'm working full time and I'm a full time parent and I'm trying to balance other aspects of my life, like, I don't know, maybe writing a second book um, that I, I do find that I am prioritizing the friends who reciprocate who are willing to have that heart connection that Shannon, who actually, who check both boxes. They they fill that deep heart connection and they're the ones I really have fun with. That's and 
thankfully, yeah, that uh, I have m many people in my life who are in that sweet spot. And then it's just a matter of all the scheduling, which, <laughs> which is tough when time is at a premium, but finding those little ways to stay connected and, and knowing and hoping and planning for the day when our stage of life opens up a little bit more and we can, um, we can get back to that. And I will say to the post COVID piece of that, I'm an extrovert and pandemic was just completely enervating for me. Like it was so hard not to be able to have that easy quality time with people without it being fraught with tension or fear. And especially because we all had little unvaccinated people and it just made everything harder. And I find that I'm, I'm having to warm back up now that we're out of that fear and tension. Uh, and that I, I find myself more drained by social experiences because I'm I'm out of practice, but getting my mojo back, and I'm I'm really grateful that I'm I'm able to get my my mojo back there. Um, Caroline had I hope it uh, Caroline Caroline apologies if I'm mispronouncing how you prefer um, asks what is one spiritual practice or discipline that you'd recommend to folks in our 40s. I feel so removed from some of the practices that really held me in my early 20s. I've been longing for that connection again. So Shannon, you were kind of talking about some of your practices from your 20s, but what, yeah, what do your practices look like today? Nothing like they did in my 20s. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I relate to that a lot. And I think I'm still kind of in the exploration phase of like figuring out what does work for me? And I think one thing that I've landed on that I know is practices that are embodied. Um, and I, for me, like yoga is something that is, is like spiritual and psychological as well as physical. So I really, um, I'm not like actively taking classes right now, but even just making time alone in my home to like move my body through the poses and just, it, it clears my mind. And I like to, I like to think of it as prayer because like in that state, I am just present in the moment. And, um, and sometimes I do kind of like make connections, which I consider to be like God speaking to me, like making connections about things in my life or things that are going on internally. Another thing for me is mm, like taking walks in the woods. And I know like not everybody has woods in their backyard, so that's not mm -hmm. accessible to everyone, but, but even like somewhere in town, um, if there's, if there's a place with trails or whatever, um, my spouse is very into meditation. So he sits still and meditates and I could never, <laughs> like, could just never. Um, but like, I love that he found a practice that worked for him, that he, was not doing in his twenties, you know, and he's found, he's done a few different like variations of that and kind of had to trial and error to find what works for him. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the difference between us, I think really highlights some of, um, yeah, just like that you kind of have to try things and find, find your own things. For me, reading can really be a spiritual practice, reading poetry, um, or like beautiful prose. And I, I mean, I think my idea of prayer has expanded so much. I almost never sit down with a list and, you know, but, but if I have, you know, like my friend has breast cancer right now. So like, yes, like I make it a point to pray for her every single day, but like regularly it's less of a list and more of like a, a paying attention, you know, of like mm -hmm. what is going on inside of me and like what is being stirred up and how am I responding to the spirit? Um, yeah. So that's kind of a long-winded answer. I don't know, Julia, what about you? I'm curious about you. Yeah. Well, this is interesting what you were just saying about the idea of prayer as presence. That's something I, I come back to a lot uh, and sometimes wonder if I'm <laughs> just making excuses for <laughs> not always being able to spend a long amount of dedicated time. Um, but but the idea of of being attentive, paying attention to myself, to where I am at the moment. Um, I th For me, in terms of embodied practice, uh, singing. So I, I'm i a lifelong singer. I've, I've done, you know, been in, in groups and in shows and I've taken voice lessons and it, that's always been my musical outlet. And I just stopped singing cold during pandemic. Like I lost my voice. I just did not want to do it. And it wasn't until 
that as we began to reemerge, that all of a sudden that feeling came rushing back to want to sing again. And to me, that breathing, that embodiment is a form of prayer, particularly I mean, my husband and I met doing church music. So there is, you know, there's um, a real, there's a love connection there for me too of, of, of liturgical music and um, music as worship. Um, and I would say the writing, I mean, that I, I mentioned earlier, I, I do a monthly reflection on my, my, uh, on my website and that those couple hours that I spend writing that is deeply meditative for me. And it's often how I, I, I wrestle with a big question I have that month or that is dedicated time for me to really think through that and pray through that. And it's not dedicated time I often get elsewhere. So I think those are my practices right now. Um, I'm looking through the questions we have. So we, we're not going to be able to get to everybody, but we do have a, a few Catholic adjacent questions. I um, was trying to see how I might like kind of get, tie them together. So um, building off Elizabeth's question, uh, how do you na navigate marriage parenting choices when you're at different places in your faith? And I would add friendships to this too, to kind of go back to Melanie's, like any relationship in our life where we're at different places in our, in our faith. And the idea of, um, I'm also kind of pulling in Terry's idea of wanting to connect to the beautiful parts of a faith while maybe also guiding people in, in this case she's asking about children but i would again bring it back to the relationship piece of how how do we draw in and examine the trickier or more complex or complicated parts of our faith too no matter what denomination we're we're coming from so um, maybe start with the relationship. How do we navigate when we're in different places in a relationship uh, spiritually? Yeah. Um, I think this, it's an important and I think very relatable question. I feel like to some extent, most couples can relate to that. Um, but I also feel like it's, it so depends on the, the couple and the, or the individuals, like you said, it could be, it could be like a relationship with, um, a close friend. I, you know, and so I hesitate to like make a blanket statement just based on my own experience or my own relationship. Um, but I think what I have thinking about my own and what I have observed from friends that, that I have, I think the biggest thing is, um, is trusting each other and and respect for um for the other person's inner world i guess like like um and i think that's tricky because you know i there's you know i don't know your relationship i don't know the person the the partner that that is in question but i think the best practice in marriage for me has been differentiating between um, like my spouse believing something or wanting to practice or explore something and myself. But like, like I said, we started off marriage, like deeply evangelical missionaries, you know? So it was like, we were just like enmeshed in this, like, we have to believe the same thing or the world is going to end, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been like, as we've grown and, and changed and matured, like it, there has been, it's, it's uncomfortable sometimes. And it's kind of hard to like, be like, oh, okay. Like we're not the same person and we are going to have different, um, different experiences of God or different, different opinions about religious things or spiritual things. And, but we, that doesn't have to threaten the quality of our relationship. It just means that we have to kind of become more individuated and and secure in that and also give each other like a deep sense of respect and trust um it is complicated though when you're talking about how to raise children and you know that requires a lot of compromise i think and a lot of conversation and a lot of fluidity um when you don't see eye to eye on things um and i don't have like a cut and dry answer for that unfortunately other than like it takes a lot of um, communication and a lot of understanding and sometimes maybe even a lot of therapy to like come <laughs> to a place, you know, um, to be able to give each other that respect um, and, and come to something that feels mutually agreeable 
when you're when you're talking about raising your children. And I do think that at a certain age, it's healthy and appropriate to tell children like, you know, your parents or or these people who are really important in your life, like we don't agree exactly on this, but like here's what I think, here's what you might think. And that kind of comes back to like this really important factor of of releasing this like illusion of controlling our children's understanding of God or experience mm-hmm. of God. Um, and I think it's really important to, to offer them a, a realistic view of like all of these people you love, like see things a little bit differently and, and however you grow to see them is okay too. However you grow up to experience God or what you decide you believe is okay too. And we're still going to love you and be a family or whatever. Um, so I do think that there's some benefit to that rather than, you know, how many of us were raised, which was like, there is one thing to believe. And if you don't believe it, then you're wrong, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think that there's some, there's some benefit there. And I'm, I'm thinking of it from a friendship perspective. And I, that I, I know I have one friend in particular is my, in mind as a master of this, who I've known for decades and uh, one of the things I have struggled with in our friendship as we get older is not the fact that she is an atheist. I struggle with the fact that she is a black and white thinker. So even though on paper, our values align or our political beliefs align or things like that, she uh, struggles to admit nuance in, in people, in topics, uh, and I, I find it, I'm finding it very hard to be at that different point, uh, because I feel like we can't engage in a meaningful dialogue about it, not with any aim of convincing anybody of anything, but that to me is part of friendship and part of cultivating a relationship is, is being able to be, uh, with, and then be vulnerable with them about what you truly believe in. And I feel like I can't, but we no longer have that aspect in our relationship and that's a that's a grief for me to be at a certain point the difference with a friendship being you know we don't we haven't um had quite the same covenant that I do in my marriage you know like if if we if we drift apart we so 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 be it you know we're we're not dissolving an entire life built together um but but there's still some grief and loss in that but also hope that we will each continue growing and learning and that maybe our paths and our ability to have these conversations will intersect again. And I I really hold on to that hope too. So I want to be conscious of that. We have five minutes left and I just want to, so I want to, I want to close on two things, even though I had, so I'm just going to email you Shannon, because I have so many other questions that I (laughs) I want to know from you. And we've had so many beautiful questions in the chat too, that I know we didn't all get to today. And thank you to everyone who chimed in and replied to one another. And I encourage you to continue that. Um, so to celebrate my 40th birthday, which was last weekend, I had a dinner party with just adults because my, I really wanted to have finished an adult conversation with people, which I felt like I hadn't been able to do in a few years. And the criteria for the people I invited were that they had to already have turned 40 and that they need to be old friends of mine. Like I need to have known them for a while. And I asked them different prompts throughout the evening. And the thing we closed with at the end of the evening, we were all sitting around the campfire, was I had asked them to bring a small object that symbolized what their wish was for me for the next 40 years of my life. And then they all held out this object and they shared with me what their their wish was. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask a version of this to Shannon, but I'm also going to ask if everybody on the call, you warm up your chat fingers again. so as a birthday present to me, I would love for you to finish the sentence for me in the chat. So for folks folks listening today, the one piece of wisdom I want to share with you is, so in your case, you don't have to have already turned 40. If we have people who are younger than 40, everybody has wisdom to share. And I would love to glean it for in celebration of my birthday. So again, the one piece of wisdom I want to share with you is, and Shannon, my question for you as, as folks are typing that in, is what is your prayer for yourself for the next 40 years? Oh, God. One. <laughs> like, 
Oh, I... Sounds kind of funny, but I think my prayer for myself is that I would continue to grow into myself. Mm. Um, because I feel like I've just started doing that and, and I hope it lasts a long time. And the more I, yeah, the more I start, you know, walking down that, that path, the more I feel like I am in love with the world and with life and um, the people around me and myself. So it's a lot of joy. That's a beautiful prayer. Mm -hmm. Love that. And if anybody, oh, it's coming in. Thank it's you. It's coming. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, this is wonderful. So indeed, become more of who you are. Don't need to live your life. Don't let fear, shame, or guilt dictate what you experience or understand about yourself. The more you love yourself, the more you'll be able to love others. Brave looks different for different people. Oh, I feel yeah. I feel that one deeply. Yeah. Uh, find and live your authentic you. Don't ever think you are done. You will change, grow, learn, and make mistakes. Uh, it's okay. Keep seeking wonder. Uh, most power, free and powerful thing you can do for yourself and others, faith is to be willing to say, I don't know. Oh, amen mm -hmm. to that. I love that. Um to love others better and be less afraid. No, am I day and you deeply as a woman? Yes, we had a question about patriarchy earlier. We didn't get to, and I so really appreciate that we're bringing that back. Uh, put love and gratitude at the center of your life every day. These are beautiful pearls, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for, for spending this time with That's us good. today. Many, many thanks to Shannon for her willingness to to enter into this conversation with me and having me a relative internet stranger ask her lots of deeply personal questions. It was really fun. Who she is as a human being and as um, a child of God. So thank you. And uh, special thanks again to Lake Drive Books for hosting us all today. And to all of you for joining and helping me ring in my 40th birthday with a lot of love, wisdom, and excitement. And hope to see you all across the interwebs and uh, whatever you're up to for the rest of the day, may it be glorious. And we hope to see you all again soon.